Hello everyone and welcome to another bad movie review with the Unsavory Heroes, where we watch bad movies so you don't have to. For this week's video, ladies and gentlemen, we have finally hit that time. A time in which I wish never existed. This week's review features the 10 year anniversary of a film that's regarded as possibly one of the worst ever made. I'm talking of course about Adam Sandler's epic, Jack and Jill. The 2000s got off to a bit of a rough start for Adam Sandler, what with the release of Little Nicky. And ever since then it's been... Let's just say mediocre, but for this film, wow. It's like he went into a room with a bunch of people, sat them all down, and looked them all dead in the eyes, and said, let's make the worst movie of all time. And it was met with thunderous applause. Just how terrible is this movie? Well, I mean, it did win 14 awards, but 10 of those are Razzies. Three of those were pretty much Worst Picture Awards, and the one positive was a Blimp Award, which in case you didn't know, is for the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. Kids really do say the darndest things. Well, it's time to find out if this movie is truly as terrible as everyone has made it out to be for the last decade. And this will be my first time watching it, so join me as we go on this adventure together through Jack and Jill. Our movie begins with a compilation of multiple sets of twins talking about their relationships for about a minute and a half. This is immediately followed by home video footage of Jack and Jill growing up for over a little over two minutes. So for the first roughly four minutes of this 90 minute runtime, all we get are twins, twins, and twins. When we finally get to Adam Sandler, he's on the set of a commercial shoot for Pepto-Bismol starring Regis Philbin. We also see Dana Carvey in his first movie since the disaster that was Master of the Skies. Regis doesn't like his line, and Tim Meadows shows up and mentions really his only reason to be in the movie, and that's to inform Jack about Dunkin' Donuts updates. He tells Jack to get Al Pacino for a commercial to promote a new coffee. He also gives the audience its first plot point in that Jack has one month to get the famous actor to do the commercial. Todd shows up and tells us information we'll need later about a cruise Jack and his family will take after Hanukkah. He also tells us that Jill changed her flight and she'll now arrive at four in the morning. Still under control of Tom Cruise. 17 Magazine. Yes! <laughs> Katie Holmes, playing the role of Aaron, tells Jack to compliment Jill on something. Jack arrives at the airport and we get our first look at Jill. I'm assuming this airport is LAX. And for one of the busiest airports in the United States, it is pretty empty in here, even for a 4 a.m. flight, especially during the holiday season. Jack wants to set Jill up at the hotel, but she guilt trips him into staying at the house. Back at the mansion, the grandparents have a homeless man as a guest to feel better about all the money they have and feel this is some sort of charity, when in reality, they're just giving the guy a false sense of happiness before sending him right back out to the woods the very next day. Jack wakes up Jill, where it turns out she has a pretty bad sweat shadow. At the dinner table, Jill guilt trips the grandma about where she's sitting at the table before finally taking a seat. For some reason, she thinks homeless people are deaf. She gives us our first take of her not knowing what movie to reference, despite giving the whole plot to the film. Sophia asks Jill if she has twin powers with her brother. Jack denies this, so Jill starts smacking herself. Aaron comes up with the idea that maybe they can finish each other's sentences. Jill, of course, is way off. She calls Jack Pagogo, which is what she called him when they were younger as part of their own language. This sets Jack over the edge and he finally snaps at Jill. She goes running off into the woods and we find out Jill doesn't know what the internet is despite being the year 2011. What I'm guessing is the next day, Jack is watching a video of Al Pacino rightfully snapping at an audience member for having their phone go off in the middle of his play. I'm with Pacino on this one. Have some f***ing courtesy if you're gonna go to a play or a movie. But one thing I would like to point out is why is it every time in a movie where there's a YouTube video or handheld footage caught by someone, there are always these weird angles and multiple takes of things. So unless this video was composed by multiple people sitting throughout the theater and they all got together and said, hey, send me your footage, I'm gonna piece this together for YouTube later on. There's no way this video would have been made this way. Jack gets a call with news about Pacino going to the upcoming Laker game. And then we meet Felipe, whose every line involves some sort of terrible joke that is likely to involve some sort of stereotype about Mexicans. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were a wax sculpture. No, man, I'm the janitor. I'm supposed to be cleaning, but I'm so tired. Jill gives Jack a list of things she wants to do before leaving. Jack doesn't think she'll be able to accomplish this with how few days she has remaining with them, but then she breaks the news she has an open-ended ticket for her flight back. We then get a montage, That's called a montage. which includes Jill killing a horse, creepily staring at Jack while he sleeps, and knocking herself out on the wheel on The Price is Right. Back at home, Jack watches Jill as she rides a jet ski around in the pool. At the movie theater, 
Jack and Jill show their similar characteristics by holding the same pose, both simultaneously hacking on a popcorn kernel, laughing, resting, scratching their crotch, and farting the exact same way. Jill's phone then goes off, and of course she has no sense of where she is and just talks as loud as possible. Hello? Hey girl, I'm in the movie. And then she storms off when Jack yells at her. The next morning, Aaron suggests maybe Jill is just lonely, giving Jack the idea to set her up with a guy. She then sets up an online profile, but doesn't get any hits. At the office, Tim Meadows reminds us all about the Laker game tomorrow night and having to make the Al Pacino deal come through. That night, it turns out Jill didn't receive any messages. I like how they play sad music for this part right here. Look, from my opinion, Jill is not a likable character. From what we've seen out of her so far, she's loud, obnoxious, has no sense of social awareness, and she guilt trips people all the time. There's really not one likable trait about her. Okay, maybe she has a big heart, but just doesn't know how to show it. But even so, that doesn't give her a pass. Jack comes up with the idea to place an ad on Craigslist, which directs people to her online profile. The next morning, Jill's excited because she had over 100 messages and has a date that night. Later on, Jill's date arrives and it's Norm MacDonald. May rest in peace. He doesn't seem too thrilled during the date and excuses himself from the table. Sometime later, Jill goes to check on her date in the restroom, but she can't find him, even though all she had to do was look up. One thing I'd like to point out about this guy is that yes, he should have just toughed it out and sat through the rest of the date. However, when you think about it, He's a pretty considerate person. He left the stall door unlocked, allowing anyone to come and go at their own leisure while he was kung fu ninja death gripping the light above. He could have easily locked that door and made someone potentially shit their pants. But no, he thought about everyone else and thought that would be a bad idea and left that door unlocked. God knows how many shits he was hanging there for, but at least he was thinking about other people. Jill arrives home and storms off upstairs after the kids barrage her with questions. Aaron and company go to console Jill, and it turns out Jack is taking her to the Laker game tomorrow night. Because it's an Adam Sandler movie, basketball is shown and we see Kobe Bryant. Pacino sits courtside next to Johnny Depp. He's incognito because he doesn't want to get recognized, but of course it doesn't work. Jack introduces himself and it's an awkward interaction. Jill starts talking and Jack mentions she's from the Bronx. For some reason, this sparks Pacino's interest. They could have picked literally any other reason for him to be infatuated with her? How many people has Al Pacino come across that have been from the Bronx since the time he has become a famous actor? It would be one thing if Pacino was from some small country that had maybe a million people. I don't know. I can't really think of anything right now. But a quick Google search of the population of the Bronx shows that in 2020, the population of the borough was 1.4 million people. That is about the size of a small country, and it's not even all of New York City. Anyway, enough of that tangent. Jill wants nothing to do with Pacino and pulls away before Jack can get anything done with the star. During the game, Pacino lustily stares at Jill and sends her a hot dog with his number written in ketchup. Not gonna lie, that's f***ing smooth. On the car ride home, Jack tries to convince Jill to call Pacino, but she doesn't want to do it. She mentions how she's going to stay longer, and of course Jack is not happy about this. So much so, he commits some major traffic violations. At the birthday dinner, it turns out it's a surprise party. For some reason, Tim Meadows is shocked that the two twins look alike. And one of the ultimate signs of this movie not aging well, Jill's conversing with the old subway guy, whose name we shall not mention. But the way that I lost so much weight was that I got AIDS. The hits just keep coming as the next scene Jill's talking with Vince Offer, the ShamWow guy. To seek revenge against Todd for setting up the party, Jack tells Jill Todd's an atheist. This also gets John McEnroe involved, and of course because everyone knows him for his outbursts on the court and not because he's a Hall of Fame tennis player, he has a meltdown and threatens Todd. As the crowd chants fight, the birthday cake is brought out. Jill isn't happy because she's ungrateful and doesn't understand why there's only one cake. Jill goes to the coat room where Al Pacino is waiting on her. How long has he been sitting in that room? He takes her over to his place under the impression he was bringing her to a bakery. This has some serious SVU vibes. He shows a plethora of sweets he made for her birthday. How did he know it was her birthday? Pacino has Jill play stickball inside the house. What I'm assuming is the next morning, Felipe finds Jill sleeping in the woods. He decides to bring her to his family picnic. As it turns out, she's never had Mexican food. Someone older than the age of five has not had Mexican food. Go to TripAdvisor and look at Mexican food in the Bronx. The first 30 listings are all within six miles of each other. But she's never had it? The picnic goes on and we get a montage. You need a montage. 
of some soccer, dancing, and a pinata. Pacino shows up at Jack's house and just barges his way into the home. He scavenges the house looking for Jill and gets intimate with her sweat shadow. He pretty much lays out that in order to get the deal with Dunkin' Donuts, Jack needs to set him up with Jill. Felipe drops Jill off, and before he can say something sweet, she runs off the same way I do after a $5 box from Taco Bell. In order to get Jill to stay longer, Jack tells her he wants her to go on the cruise with them. Todd tells us Jack has five days to land the Pacino deal. During Pacino's performance, another phone starts going off. This time, it turns out it's his phone ringing, so he takes the call right in the middle of the play. I'll give the movie credit, this scene's actually pretty funny. Pacino tells Jack to have Jill meet him on the boat. Jack and Jill have a bonding moment with a jump rope, but this is immediately followed by Jack snapping at Jill once again. That night, Jack dresses as Jill and goes on the date with Pacino. Pacino tries to liquor her up and then tickles her. During a dance session, Jill calls Jack and finds out he's with Pacino. During a heart-to-heart -heart between Jack and Al Pacino, he has an epiphany about his sister. Jack somehow returns to the cruise and discovers Jill has gone back home. Don't ask how that happened. New Year's Eve comes around and Jill is at a bar by herself. She comes across some old classmates from high school and they start ridiculing her. David Spade is dressed in drag. Jack and his family show up and Jack starts speaking in their twin language. Aaron for some reason picks a fight with Monica. Jill hops in and throws her into a wall. Pacino shows up out of nowhere as Don Quixote and gives up his obsession with Jill. They arrive at Jill's place where Felipe and his kids have perfectly shoveled her front yard and he confesses his feelings for her. We're shown the Dunkin' Donuts commercial with Al Pacino and he gives us his thoughts on not only the ad, but the movie as a whole. Burn this. This must never be seen by anyone. In All movie. copies. Destroy them. The credits roll, and we get some more clips of twins sharing their experiences with each other. That's Jack and Jill, ladies and gentlemen, and I have to say, I actually didn't mind it that much. Say what? Hold on, hold on. Let me at least give my perspective first. Okay, so it's not a good movie. Let's just start with that. And Jill is arguably the worst character in this thing. I mean, she's just awful and her one redeeming characteristic is that she has a big heart however everything she does in this movie counteracts that how can she be as old as she is and not realize what she's doing is putting a strain on her relationship with her brother throughout the movie you get the sense this isn't the first time he's been fed up with her shit. unless there's some underlying mental health issue this movie's trying to address and i highly doubt that's the case she's just a terrible character She's just poorly written. At the end, Jack is the one who has the eureka moment that he has to be nicer to his sister, but it's not through anything she has done. He has to be told this by Al Pacino. Where's Jill's moment of clarity where she has to realize she also needs to be nicer to Jack and his family? Because what we've seen throughout the movie is that she ridicules everyone on everything they do. And don't even get me started about how she's racist. I didn't even touch on that during the review. Oh, I can't go on too much longer ranting about this movie. I'm gonna blow an O-ring. How this movie grossed almost $150 million on a little over $74 million budget is beyond me and defies all logic. To wrap up why this isn't the worst movie I've ever watched, it does have some pretty funny moments and Al Pacino is just great. He may have won a Razzie for Worst Supporting Actor, but I, I, I laughed, he was funny. So for those reasons, I'm still gonna go ahead and give this two out of six beers. Master of the Skies is still way worse than this, and that's our bottom. That'll wrap things up for this edition of another bad movie review with the Unsavory Heroes. If you made it to this point in the video, thanks for sticking around. And make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons below to help support the channel. If you have anything you'd like to say about the review, the movie itself, or if you have any ideas of films we should feature in the future, make sure to leave those in the comments as well. And if you'd like, we also stream on Twitch pretty much every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So check out our social channels to stay up to date on whenever we go live. Because you know it'll happen if you don't. I'm Thadaconda saying thanks for stopping by and we'll see you next time here on another bad movie review with the Unsavory Heroes.